thank you for coming this afternoon. I wanted to start by hearing a little bit about who you are, where you grew up, um, who was in your family, uh, were they a Christian family, okay. that kind of thing. So um, I was brought up in a, a Christian home, mum and dad, very committed Christians, I think uh, did a lovely job of modelling Christ um, to us as kids. I've got two older brothers and an older sister. Um, I think when we were young, we probably all professed faith. Um, I... <laughs> Do you remember, um, some of you will be old enough to remember, Journey to Life um, by Norman Warren. Do you remember that? It was a little booklet on how to become a Christian. And between about the ages of seven and 11, I probably used to read it every week in the loo and pray the prayer at the back. Because I never quite understood why I just carried on being such a rat bag as a kid and why I didn't, you know, if I was going to be like, be like Jesus, why I wasn't. But it, I went on a camp at about the age of 11, a Pathfinder camp, which is like a youth camp. And heard a talk on the cross and realised that Jesus died once for all my sin. I didn't have to keep, you know, sort of keep becoming a Christian. So that, that was a breakthrough point for me. Um, I was quite a nice teenager. Didn't do anything. I smoked a bit. <laughs> but part, I was quite nice. Thought I was all right. Um, and then went to university. Okay, before we get to university, yeah. let me just go back. Whereabouts were you when you were growing up? Essex, which is one of the uh, sort of counties around London. So if I've I'm heard of Essex girls. We're, we're, we're quite renowned the world over, Essex girls, for being classy, <laughs> intelligent, stylish, sophisticated. Yeah, that's all. Your yeah. daughter is shaking her head violently. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. We've got a terrible reputation. Do you? Yeah. Shame. Okay. So you grew up in Essex, yep. went to church, yep. came, became a Christian, you said, about 11, 11, yep. 11 years old. Mum and dad, Christian and older brothers and sister professing faith mm -hmm. at that point. Yep. But then you said, and you went to university and that sounds like it was a turning point for you. So where did you go to university and what happened there? Right, so I was at Hobbiton College, which is uh, part of Cambridge University. Okay. And, but it's the teaching college. And I just clearly remember first week uh, looking at the, the Christian Union up in their room going, what, why are you up there? You need to be in the bar witnessing. So I went into the bar and stayed there pretty much for four years. So <laughs> that didn't work so well. And what happened was classic. I, I never stopped believing the gospel was true, but my lifestyle stopped matching what I said was true. And therefore I shut up about what was true and just gradually drifted off. So you didn't go to church during that time? Show up occasionally just to keep, there was enough spies around with my parents and stuff to just, you know, keep people at arm's length, you know, shut. got involved with Christians in sport. Again, good ruse, keep people at arm's length. Oh, she's fine. She's, you know, part of Christian. So I was quite cunning. Is it, is it true that you played rugby yeah. at university? You wouldn't imagine it, would you? No. <laughs> no ballet maybe, but no, we... Partly, it was, a, it was quite a new thing at that time. Women's rugby was just uh, taking off. And my brothers had always played and I'd always loved it. And we, we, you know, the blokes that were willing to train us were all right. So we, we weren't taking it very seriously, but it was good fun, it was good fun. It wasn't serious, and, but it's now very serious. It's a blue sport, you know, it's international, whatever. Absolutely. But, yeah. So you were in Christians in sport. So that was really to pacify the spies and um, you turned up to church occasionally. Where did you go to church during that time? So, um, what would have still been the round church? Uh, it's now um, St Andrews the Great. St Andrews the Great, if um, anybody's familiar yeah. with that church in Cambridge. Eden Baptist Church I'd rock up to Okay. Yeah, you know, spread myself around as well so right. nobody could pin me down. <laughs> right. Okay. Mm. And um, mum and dad were happy, didn't know? Didn't know. I was yeah. complete schizophrenic, you know, spiritually. Okay. Mm. And when you went home at university holidays, did what happened then? How did... Just carried on as if everything was fine. Right, okay. And so, that is so dangerous for the kid that's been brought up in a Christian home. Yeah. You just play the game. Um, it's terrifying. So when... What happened to change that? What I think God in his grace... Um, so I could never look him in the face and say that what I did was in any way good, because it wasn't, but he used it in the most extraordinary way. So when I'd finished messing about and doing all the stuff you're not supposed to do, you, I, I, you just reach rock bottom. 
you just go, God, is that, is that what the world was offering? And Spain was so great. And actually, it isn't great. And I think at that point, when the Lord literally lifted me up out of the pig pen, morally, that's when I understood grace. You know, that's when I understood what it had cost Christ to forgive me. I think as a nice kid growing up in a Christian home, you just don't always understand that. Um, so that, that, was, that was massive for me. And I think that was to come that low and to be lifted up out of that has never left me really, I think. Um, and has had um, knock-on effects in the ministry. Okay. You know, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's been able to shock me with what they've done and actually therefore can't judge anybody. You know, I've never felt in a position to go, really? <laughs> you did what? <laughs> because actually, yeah so, yeah, so the Lord in his grace uses all sorts of... Was there a particular person or a particular situation that that was influential at that time that kind of, you know, met you where you were, as it were, and, and you got to, how, how did you come to understand grace? So I kept in touch with Christian camps through all that time as well. Didn't, didn't go on them particularly as a student because I knew that would be the height of hypocrisy. But there was, um, I, as I was sort of coming back through, there was um, a, a minister called Hugh Balfour who works on the Old Kent Road and his wife, Helen. Old Kent a, Road to us. Monopoly set. Brown, the yeah. cheapest one on the Monopoly. The, the purple brownie one on the Monopoly. Quid on the Monopoly. Yeah, board. that's right. Yeah. Worst rent Worst, on yeah. Monopoly. Yeah, that's the one. So um, I'd, I'd sort of kept being on the camps with them and she, she had done the same as I had. And she was just brilliant. At, she just, you know, she was just reading like an absolute book and saying all the stuff that I'd done and she wasn't shocked and, and just said, have you finished? You know, have you finished messing with <laughs> So she was key, I think, in, in that, in lots of ways. Um, and just knowing it's true, just knowing the gospel's true, and then knowing that what the world is offering is rubbish, it does, I just think it was, I knew it was time. When you finished university, uh, what did you do at that point? So having spent four years training to be a teacher, I didn't particularly want to be a teacher, but I thought I ought to get my qualification year. So I did a year in a secondary uh, teaching art. Okay. Whereabouts was that? Uh, Essex. Okay. Um, and that then, I was back in St. Peace, Harold Wood, back in the fellowship, that, that really helped. And then from there, I did a year with Care Force up in Stockton on Tees, which is right up in the northeast okay. of England. That was at a Baptist church. And then I came back down and worked at Balfour's on the Old Kent Road. By this time, I'd met Shona. Okay. So we've been walking around for a fair amount of time. Um, so I worked for them as my assistant, and during that time, Cornhill training course, the first year they ever did it. Did people know about Cornhill training? Do you want to just explain that a little bit to us? So that, was, that came out of the Proclamation Trust. They just wanted to provide training for people who, some of them coming out of theological college, still not feeling confident that they could teach the Bible. The training was so bad in some of the colleges at that time. And also there were lay people who wanted just to be more confident handling God's word. So that at that point, it was a year course. And you did four days, and you did a placement day in the middle. And I knew as a teacher, I could pretty much communicate, but just confident in handling scripture, um, exegesis and expository. So it was a brilliant year, really key year. We have Cornhill here in Sydney, uh, for those who might be familiar with it, but I'm not sure if it entirely mirrors what they do now. But what, what kind of things did you do so during we, Cornhill? I mean, it was just, we, we had like Dick Lucas, David Jackman um, doing books like Isaiah with us. Um, that one of the breakthrough things for me was doing a Bible overview. I don't know if any of you have done it. just absolutely blew me away. And they, they were just popping up everywhere at that stage. I think people were really seeing the benefit of having this big picture of God's word uh, and just seeing the story all the way through. So that was something that we did. Uh, yeah, some of the big ones we did a, a gospel. But then you do these expository um, gobbits, they call them, where you just try and get a short talk and you get loads of feedback. Um, so it was just, it was really key, key year. After Cornhill, you then... <sighs> well, I met my future husband. Okay, I wasn't sure when he came into the picture. Yeah. Tell us about that so, meeting and how that happened and who he is. So I was pretty, I was a bit of a yob, as you can tell. I was, and I just had never assumed I was going to get married. And that was never an assumption to the point where mum and dad had divvied up their will five ways rather than four because they thought I was going to be single and doing ministry of some sort. So, yeah, we were taking it quite seriously that I was going to be. And then just, and I'd fancied blokes, you know, Christian blokes, I fancied them, but never thought I could submit to them. Like, 
idiot. You know, I just, how are you supposed to submit to somebody if you, you know, that sort of thing. Simon, during the call here, when we were, we were sort of mates, and I suddenly I was just like, do you know what? I respect him and fancy him. You know, that combination was quite <laughs> amazing. So that was interesting. So but I thought something was going to happen and then it didn't. And I was a bit bitter and it was coming to the end of Cornhill. And uh, I just thought, you know, that sort of rejected, you know, thing. So I just don't think I was being very nice to him. So anyway, it was the EMA, which is the Evangelical Minister's Assembly. And I sort of went up to him and said, oh, so I'm sorry if I've been a bit bag i just thought something might be happening with us hasn't i'd never ever said anything like that to a bloke before in my life that's pretty brave to kind of go i thought something might be happening but it wasn't so thanks very much <laughs> trusted him okay. you know i, I trusted okay. him as a friend he was mm. he's a he's a good good lad but anyway no i'd never been that vulnerable before anyway so and he went that was brave i walked off walked off oh. <laughs> The, the bitterness came back with a vengeance. <laughs> like, how can you? Anyway, so that uh, phone to my mum was like, and he said, ah, you didn't say that. I was like, blah, blah. anyway, that was that. The next day, it was the last day of Cornhill. So potentially not, not going to see him until a conference or whatever. Yeah. And he just came up to me and said, I think we need to talk. <laughs> it's one of those. <laughs> so we went and sat outside St. Helens in the bomb down there. It's when the IRA bomb had gone off. It was pretty grim. And he basically said, he said, you know, I thought I was going to be single for the Lord, but if I did get married, I could imagine being married to you. So should we just see how it goes? <laughs> and when he says, see how it goes, does that mean, what does, it, what does that mean? It meant marriage. Right. But I don't, I, do you know, I'm not even sure he actually fancied me. Seriously, okay. I think we are, it was that bizarre. Right. How many years have you been married now? 25. 25. So we started going out on the basis that this is probably going to end in marriage. Sure. Oh, weird. So, weird. so where were you and where was he after Cornhill? Like, yeah. yeah. So they, he then went 100 miles out of London to Burton-on-Trent. Okay. I stayed in, I went back to Essex to be a youth worker at the same church where I'd grown up in. Okay. St Pete's. Yep. We used to speak once a week on the phone. Nice. He's that sort of, you know, bloke. Yeah. But so too, I don't like talking on the phone anyway, so that was fine. But we had a long distance relationship, um, but with this idea that we're going to get married. But let me just tell you a lovely story. So before we'd started going out, we'd got lost on a train journey together and we got chatting and I th probably thought I liked him a bit. But anyway, and we were talking about our past. He was, a, he was an atheist until he was about 28. And he became a Christian because he was living with a backslidden Christian. And she, amazingly, had taken him to a, a church that wasn't her church, but was a Bible teaching church, and he'd become a Christian. So he had a bit of a shady past. I had a shady past. And I just remember saying to him, you know, one day I just, I, I know I'm going to have to tell, you know, a man potentially about that, and that they could just go, no thanks. Anyway, so in, it got to the stage in our relationship, and I just thought, I need to be completely honest with him about the past. So um, we were 150 miles apart. We planned to go up. We weren't going to go out for dinner. I cried all the way up in the car, thinking this could be it. And um, we went out for dinner, poured it all out. And then there was just this pause. And he said, will you marry me? But just that beautiful picture of Grace at the point where you could be rejected. Yeah. You are completely... Wow, isn't that wonderful? That is an amazing picture of Grace, isn't it? And, and I've met Simon, and he is a lovely, lovely man. So you got married that year. Uh, or yeah. In a, in a, um, then you and he moved, did ministry together. So he did his first curacy at this church, and I went up and joined him okay. halfway through. Okay. Um, Anglican church, quite traditional, but a lovely evangelical had been in and, and they were really moving it forward yeah um classic british town where there was a village a bridge and a town and the people in the village didn't cross the go to the town Classic. <laughs> we do that with the harbour bridge and then and then the bridge is into the shire as well but then you moved is that when you moved to dagnam tell us about dagnam tell us about uh moving there what it was like yeah so we um we both because we both worked he'd worked in Durham and trained up in Durham, Newcastle. I'd worked in Stockton on Tees. We both wanted to go to the northeast um, to do some urban, some sort of urban ministry. And we waited and we waited, and no jobs were coming up. Uh, we went on a 
a reform conference, bound to meet somebody mm. who's got... And uh, a, a bloke called Mike Reith came up to us and... Um, oh, actually, no, no, big upon. We'd been having an interview with Church Society and someone phoned and said, have you found anyone for Dagnum yet? On the end of the phone, it was Mike Reith. And the man's going, no, but there's a couple here that want to do urban ministry. I'm like, get them over here immediately. It's, it's, army. it's a terrifying army. Anyway, so suddenly we were looking at a church in Essex, whereas we'd be, so it was not where we'd expected. Where you'd a, grown up. Not, yeah, seven miles away from my mum. So we went to, we heard about the job and then thought about the job and then went to the conference and Mike Reith was there and he just put some serious pressure on saying you're right. going to make, make a decision so we thought it's just it's ticking all the boxes apart from location sure. and the day we said yes to Dagenham we heard about three other jobs oh, okay. just classic and you just had to go oh, okay Lord that's tell us about Dagenham as a place uh, some of the challenges some of the wins that you've had in ministry there just tell us about so it was um, it was a purpose built what would you call it government housing yep. yeah so, it was, so it's a purpose built council estate it was the biggest one in Europe at the time and they called it houses fit for heroes so it was people coming back out of the first world war who and the, the, they were trying to clear the slums in London in the east so they shifted everybody out of the east end Okay. to go live in these houses so it was it was they felt like they were moving out to the country at the time but it very quickly became an urban sprawl Fords the Fords work with the big employers um, so it's now just a massive council estate but with lots of people having bought their own houses now Maggie Thatcher gave people the chance to buy their council house back in the 80s um, which is extraordinary because it actually created this extraordinary wealth for people um, so when we arrived in 1996 it was about probably 90% white okay and then we've been there 23 years and it's now probably less than half uh, white indigenous it's now massively massive influx of Nigerians Ghanaians uh, Asian increasingly so it's very multicultural and it is it would have probably been one of the most racist areas in Britain so and then the government just did this thing. And so suddenly people are having to really mm. rub shoulders and work it out. So, and I just, it's been amazing. It hasn't blown up, you know, hasn't, there, there's racism and people don't get on, but it could have been so much worse um, than it has been. So we thank God for that. Um, so yeah, so we've been there 23 years. It's very urban, lots of uh, the problems that would go with that, uh, single parents, uh, unemployment, drugs, uh, all sorts of things. It's just, it is a classic sort of a, but interestingly, the influx of particularly Nigerian has suddenly, they're quite middle class. Okay. So you get this interesting mix of a middle class um, a migrant population mixing in with a indigenous lower or benefit class or whatever. So it's, that's had all sorts of issues. And I think as a church, Simon has just been desperate to model Ephesians chapter two to try and work out what it means that all the barriers are down. Yeah. You know, that actually Christ is the, the unifying factor. And yeah, we bring our culture, but it's the, it's the same gospel for everybody. And that's the, I think that's be, what we've really tried to work on over time. And it's not easy. And people, and, and just trying to work out what, what are the essence, what is it, sorry, what is the essence of church? What makes church um, a, a New Testament model rather than all the cultural stuff? that we think is church and that we think is good actually could just be middle class twaddle do, do, do you know what I mean it's, it's so so I think that's been a, a real exercise for us is to try and create something that is beginning to look like uh, what what Christ intended when he won that um that salvation for us those uh different ethnic groups uh, do, have they come with um, particularly with Muslim faith or is it like how has that worked in the not just the multi-ethnic but the multi-faith no I think most I think that's the area that because it's becoming more Muslim okay. recently I think that's an area that they're going to have to really think about most of the Nigerians would have come from a Christian okay. more of a Christian. saying that there's been this massive influx of Iranians and they've a lot of them have come to faith and a lot of them have said they've come to faith got baptized and vanished so that's been that's a real wisdom you know you just take people almost at face value um but that and, and there's one church near us particularly who's had a real ministry amongst them but that hasn't been straightforward 
you know, that can be very hurtful, can't it, if you've invested loads in people and they just up and off. So Sounds like uh, some of the challenges that you've been facing there are some of the challenges a lot of our churches mm -hmm. are facing yeah. uh, with particular multi-ethnic, uh, multi-faith, uh, refugee, all those kind of yeah. um, complexities. In amongst that, one of the things, I've visited Lizzie's home twice now, one, uh, and one of the things I've noticed as I've come into your home, um, Mess? Apart, no, no. <laughs> your three children, you've got three children, Sam, Ailey, and Ailey's here with us today, and Beatrice. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of other people in your home when I visited your home. Were so, there? <laughs> yeah. So whether they're there for dinner or living there, but there's some kind of just connection. It seems to me you've had a very open home in ministry. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how, was there a decision about that? Did you purposely create that kind of culture environment? How's that gone for your kids? I think I'm naturally quite claustrophobic and the thought of living in a small house freaks me out. Of course I'm big. But one of the prayers I prayed way back when we were for uh, first, for Simon's first incumbency, I just said, Lord, if you just give me some space, I don't care where you send me, please just give me some space and I promise I'll use it. And so he sent us to Dagenham, which was unexpected, but he, there was just this, they give you these stupid five bedroom houses. And it just, it, it wasn't, oh, I wouldn't say it was, uh, right, we're going to do this, this, this. It just happened. It just evolved. We, we had... We had one person sleeping on a dining room table at one point. It was just, it was just this a DOS house, really. People just came and went. Some people stayed for a year. Some people stayed for two years. Some people stayed for six years. And we had an Aussie who I foolishly said on Long Island, oh, yeah, do come and stay. You know, Zanzibar Island. And she came for six months. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. So, you know. So I'm going to be careful this yeah, time. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> but I think the, the, the wonderful thing was um, this Cornhill course in London um, a lot of the uh, they're, they're called Ewan boys you know the Ewan boys they're sort of public school posh boys okay posh yep. boys. And private they, school boys yeah, private school boys and they they sort of got sent to us to do their placement because it, it was seen as a good way of rubbing off their or sure. roughing them up actually not rubbing them down, roughing them up uh, but it was just this beautiful relationship because they they're so well mannered and they're gonna get eaten alive in some of the but actually they're brilliant mm. and they've just got on really well with the local people. The local people love them. It's just, and, and it has given them a really good urban experience. So, yeah, they've come and lived with us. Um, we've had, we had an Iranian living with us. Uh, we had a, a, a bloke turned up on our door one night, a West Indian bloke who was um, looking for somewhere to stay the night. He stayed for six years. <laughs> a caravan in the front garden. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so just explain to us, how do you do that with family? Like often here, I think we oscillate between wanting an open home and, you know, doing that, but then freaking out about having too many through our home and, and protecting our family and all of those kind of things. How, how do you ensure that family life worked? And I mean, I probably should be asking Ailey this could question. Ask Ailey. You could bring out all sorts of childhood um, trauma yes they become part of the family but a lot of them don't actually sit with us for meals and i think that's probably because i'm not a right you know cooking make your cooking rubbish i don't want to stay for dinner so the iranian but your fish pie was us. lovely actually paul was a vegetarian he never ate with us because we um so no, it's just, it has just evolved so they had to just chat to people so you think for family life that was a real obviously a real positive for mm, your kids and we're, Ailey's nodding, everybody, so it's okay. She's fine. I guess, though, it, put, it does put pressure on the ministry, on the family. You know, you've been working part-time through all of that. I think we saw it as the ministry. It yeah. wasn't separate from the ministry. I think that, and again, not, I don't think it was a conscious decision, but I just think if Paul's right and he says you share your lives with people, mm. I think to be preaching on a Sunday and then shutting the door in people's face and say, see you next week, that doesn't work, does it? They need to see. If you're... If you're calling people to follow Christ and you're not willing to let them see the, the muddle and the mess in your own mm. so I think I don't think it was a conscious decision I think it's just something that evolved um, yeah and it hasn't always been easy sure you know, there, there's been some lodgers that I could quite happily have you know get out 
Yeah. Because they've just been awful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brought out the best in me. <clears throat> yes. So, yeah, it's not always been a, a breeze sure. by any stretch. I'm just interested in it because I think uh, my sense is, you know, even in my own life, the sense of we home is the haven. Mm. Home is the place where I go in charge mm. in ministry. We, you know, I'm giving out all the time mm. in ministry. Home is where I go to recharge and kind of, yeah, look after me, look after the family, those kind of things. So any thoughts or, or wisdom about that, that uh, tension, I guess? So I think, I think we've been pretty good at protecting the day off. It hasn't been like the Brady Bunch. We haven't had a minibus and everyone's come on a trip with us every Saturday. You know, it's, So I think we've, we've tried to protect the day off. Um, Sam is not as good at it. He ended up running a course every other Saturday, didn't he? <laughs> on a Saturday morning, that wasn't great. But it's a great course. But So I think that was it. But I think he's just not been too precious about it, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, oh, I don't know. I, I tell you the truth. The truth probably is that I get re-energised by people. Whereas Simon would probably draw more, but he does. You know, he's, he he'll take himself off if he needs to. Sure. Um, it's knowing yourself, and it? it's knowing what you what yeah. you need. I think knowing your kids, I guess, as well, what they can cope with. And yeah. okay, Dagnum to Bodmin. Yeah. Now, in the last month, it turns out you've moved house. Did you not? You didn't know that. I didn't know it until you put something up on Facebook about going and holidaying 20 minutes from where you're now living in Cornwall. And I thought, sorry, what? What brought about that move after 23 years in Dagenham? How did that come about? It was, a, again, an, a gradual uh, process, but Simon actually had a heart attack last year, yeah. um, which took us completely by surprise. Bless him. He was in Greenwich Park London with my little nine-year-old, and he just got pains it wasn't a cardiac arrest but it was a <coughs> heart attack so bless her she had to red blue lighting down through London and it was just horrible and I think it was just a wake-up call that you think you haven't you think you're the same as you were when you're 28 and you're not and actually the church in Dagenham had grown to the point where you it, it just needed a young boat coming in to take it on where it needs to go um, so that was all sort of going on and then but Simon said, but I've still got a church inside me. I've still got a ministry inside me. He's, he'll go, he'll keep going until the day he falls over. So what, what's the sort of right thing? We've always holidayed in Cornwall. I don't know if anybody has been to Cornwall. It's beautiful. It's probably one of the most beautiful parts of Britain. But it's absolute wasteland spiritually. Um, the Wesleys did lots of work down there. So they had this massive Methodist revival. But then that all died down. And it is, it is a wasteland. You could probably count on maybe one or two hands how many evangelical churches are, uh, are down there so that's always been on our heart we've struggled to find a church on holiday to go to um so last summer we were looking for a church i won't tell you the, the story but we were looking for a church and we ended up at this tiny little church in bodmin and once someone was chatting to simon and they just happened to mention that they needed a minister so it just suddenly this whole ball sort of started rolling and, and Simon was really cautious. I think he felt, really felt the weight of leaving Dagenham. Mm. Um, people, I would say people are reliant on him. He, he's, he particularly has walked a long road with some people. Mm. You know, he's been through births and deaths, and divorces. And, and I think, yeah, so it's been, it's a long, he was really cautious about it, I think, wasn't he? I think he was concerned that, they, that people wouldn't feel they were just being abandoned. But it just, it, and the Lord just moved, you know, when you just, all the chess pieces are being moved into place in the most extraordinary way. Uh, it's just been very straightforward in lots of ways uh, to get down there. Um, and it just felt the right thing. He also got heart for Bodmin because I think what it's become is a preaching station. I think people just come in to listen to the sermon and then scuttle back off to their farms or whatever. But we want to reach Bodmin. I read in an interview you gave somewhere about this that you've only really got funding for two years. Yeah. So that's a big thing, right? Let me just say, I, I, it has been amazing. The Church of England, probably the same thing. You get a big house. Uh, you, Simon doesn't get by the Church of England because he stopped that ages ago when there was a druid for the Archbishop of Canterbury. Do you remember that one? What's his name? Yeah. Rowan Williams, that's it. So he stopped being paid by the Church of England then. But it, it's just safe. The Church of England is safe, but it's a mess. Yeah. This place, is got, it's got two, two years funding, no house for the minister, no church building. 
the one paper you're going I'm not going there but the law it's just we wrote a letter we just chucked a letter out we thought right we're not going to be British about this we're just going to ask and we sent a letter to our mates just going anyone got any money <laughs> and within about two weeks £120,000 now that's great but that's not enough for a house so I'm going all right lord you know what, what are we going to do with this and then just again this summer on a camp chatting to someone and the next week an email comes in saying we'll lend you the money for whatever you need for the it's just because we're too old to get a mortgage no one's going to give us a mortgage he's dead on his feet with a heart attack i'm you know unemployable so it's just it's hopeless but so it's but but we've both got parents with houses so money in the future is not an issue it's here and now yeah. and the christians have just come up with the, yeah i'm not trying to see anyone off the planet <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Called in this, are you? Um, actually, but that's okay. We'll we'll edit later. It's okay. <laughs> Never find it on the internet. So. We no, we no. That's <laughs> so. Isn't that incredible? You've gone. There's there's only a limited amount of funding. There's no house. There's no actual church building. And you've just sent the email out. And God's people have out of their yeah their resources. Yeah. But I, I tell the danger. Think, oh, this is great! You know, we're going to go to Bobman and we're going to see revival. God doesn't say that. Doesn't say that doesn't say that. No, it's going to be just because I've got you there doesn't mean it's going to be plain sailing. And so you just have to, yeah, just step out, step out, step out, and then trust Him all the way along the way that it's going to work out. Let me just ask you then, finally, before I just quickly talk to Shona, persevering then in ministry, what's been, uh, what's kept you going? How do you feed yourself? How do you, you know, you guys have done a hard work in Dagman. You're, you're now going to Bodmin. Um, you're not certain what that's going to be like. Uh, how do you keep feeding yourself, growing, sustaining yourself in ministry? What are some things that have been good for you? Oh man, I don't know. I just, if you know the gospel's true, you'll put up with pretty much anything, won't you? If you trust Jesus, if you if you trust that actually what he's done for you is true, what he's asking you to do for other people is true, you can pretty much put up with anything. Um, I think good friends has been absolutely key. Uh, good, always good teaching, you know, getting Bible teaching. I'm, I'm very chaotic, so I would, could not look you in the eye and say, it's my daily quiet time. That would be lying. Um, it's my sporadic, chaotic, you know, feeding off God's word. So I think there's all sorts of factors. But, yeah, just, um, yeah, just the gospel. Yeah. The gospel. Really? I know it's the answer to every question, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it really is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, if you doubted it was true, you just wouldn't do it, would you? Yeah. If you doubted what he, you know, what he, who he, who he is and, and what he's asking, you just wouldn't do it, would you? Yeah. If Why don't we leave it? And I'll just grab Shona. Thank Lizzie for those things.